Welcome, everyone. Um, I am so glad you joined us for this 20-minute briefing today. I'm Bill Sanders, uh, the Dr. William D. and Nancy W. Strecker Dean of the College of Engineering. Thank you for being here today. In this virtual series, faculty from across engineering share their insights into research, its impact, and provide a perspective for the future. Following each 20-minute presentation, attendees will have an opportunity to direct questions and comments to the speaker. Our speaker today is Assistant Research Professor Edith uh, Luanga, who will share her research on human-centered design for improving financial inclusion and health in East Africa. Before we turn things over to Edith, I'd first like to introduce Professor Conrad Tucker, who was recently appointed as the director of our CMU Africa program and campus, and as Associate Dean for International Affairs in Africa. Conrad is a professor of mechanical engineering, and he holds courtesy appointments in machine learning, robotics, and biomedical engineering here at Carnegie Mellon. His research focuses on the design and optimization of systems through acquisition, integration, and mining at large scale, disparate data. He has several collaborations in Rwanda and across the African continent. He has served as the primary investigator or co-primary investigator on federally and non-federally funded grants from the National Science Foundation, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, the Army Research Laboratory, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, among others. He received his PhD and master's in industrial engineering and an MBA degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and his bachelor's degree from rose Holman Institute of Technology. I'm thrilled to have Conrad serving as our director of the CMU Africa program and campus. Unfortunately, uh, Conrad has another engagement and can't stay with us for the entire program today. Before I turn the screen over to him to say a few words and to introduce Edith, I'd like to remind our audience to please use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions to Edith regarding your presentation. You can do this at any point during her presentation and the program. And uh, Gina Henry, the Associate Dean for Development for the College of Engineering, will moderate the question and answer session at the conclusion of the presentation. Conrad and Edith, thank you both for being here today. Conrad, over to you. My name is Conrad Tucker, the director of CME Africa, and it's my distinct pleasure to join you all the way from Kigali, Rwanda, here at the CMU Africa campus, to introduce you to our speaker for today, Edith Luhanga. Edith joined CME Africa as a postdoctoral researcher in June 2021 and transitioned to the assistant research professor position in September 2022. Prior to that, she was a lecturer at the Nelson Mandela African Institution of Science and Technology. She holds a PhD in Information Science from Nara Institute of Science and Technology in Japan, a Master's in Advanced Computing Science, and a Bachelor of Engineering and Honors in Electronic and Computer Engineering from the University of Nyack. As you'll see shortly, Edith's research focuses on design theory-based behavior change. And we're excited that Edith is applying her research in the context of African problems. So it is my distinct pleasure to welcome my colleague, collaborator, Edith Luhanga. Edith? Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with everybody here today, talking about some of the research I'm working on. As introduced, my research focuses on human-centered design um, in the health and financial inclusion for East Africa. And why health and financial inclusion? Because these two are interlinked. If you think about it, the people who are able to afford good health care, the people who are able to stop working and even get health care when they need it are the people who have good income. And the people with good income typically have the ability to go and 
uh, um, pay for large medical expenses. But on the other hand, health influences your ability to have income. If you have poor health, you're less likely to be able to access good jobs. And so I work in these two fields because they are very interlinked. But when it comes to having good health and having good finances, there are certain um, types of habits you need to have. Let's take, for example, Sustainable Development Goal 3.1 about reducing maternal mortality. At the surface level, it doesn't seem there's anything you can do on an individual level to meet this goal of reducing global maternal mortality rates. But then when you look at the studies, for example, in Rwanda and Tanzania, you notice that a lot of the causes of death are behavioral. So women are taking too long to seek healthcare after they notice dangerous signs that are predictive of preeclampsia, for example, which is high blood pressure in pregnancy, or postpartum hemorrhage, which is excessive blood loss after childbirth. Um, but we are also seeing once they get to the healthcare facility, the health workers are taking a long time to diagnose and treat the pregnancy complications. And even when they are diagnosed fairly early on, we're not seeing uh, careful adherence to protocols such as active management of the third stage of labor, which has been shown to really decrease the risk for dying from postpartum hemorrhage. So even at this global level, individual behavior change could um, change the number of deaths we see every year. The same is true for wealth. You've probably uh, heard that you need to save, invest, borrow responsibly, have insurance, because all of these protect you from financial setbacks like job loss or economic costs of living crisis, which we're all currently experiencing. But at this very core, saving, investing, borrowing can be difficult for some people either because they don't have the knowledge on how to do so, or they lack the opportunities, so lacking access to accounts that enable them to build up a credit history, and so many other factors interplay in this. So when we talk about behavior change interventions, we're really talking about finding ways to use applications, digital applications, to offer one of the 93 possible techniques for behavior change to people. And what we're seeing a lot in the literature is that 93 techniques, that's a lot. But when you dig, dig deeper, even some of the techniques in, themselves can be offered in many ways. So let's take rewards, for example. If you've ever downloaded an app like a physical activity tracking application, you know that you sometimes get virtual points when you meet your walking goal. Sometimes they have a game and you need to win points to unlock the next level in a game through the application. All these are different ways of implementing the behavior change strategies under the group of rewards. And there's been tons and tons of research over the last two decades looking at what are the most effective ways to use digital technologies to provide these be uh, behavior change interventions. But li very little of this research has been done in the African context. So we still don't really know which of these strategies is most effective when they're effective and why, and when they're ineffective and why. And that is one of the goals of my research. But the other goal of my research is to really look at addressing the mixed outcomes we're seeing. So I've mentioned that we don't really have much evidence based for Africa, but even in the global um, sense, we have a lot of evidence in terms of research studies, but they have mixed outcomes. Some studies are showing that health and finance behaviors can be changed using these techniques like money rewards and virtual trophies, but only for a limited amount of time. Some of them are showing long-term change. Some of them are not showing any change at all. And when you look at some of the recent reviews that have been done, why don't the interventions work? Well, some of the studies say we're using too few of the behavior change techniques. So there was a review done for the low and middle income country context. And they found that for maternal mobile health apps, out of the 93 possible strategies, we only have about seven that are being offered to women. And most of these strategies are just reminders on their next antenatal clinic. When you look at the needs of the groups, both the pregnant women as well as the clinicians, they feel like these apps do not really address the core challenges they face during pregnancy and during handling pregnant women. And so they have very low or limited clinical value to them. But the other reasons that the interventions don't work, we've had multiple studies now that shows that the apps are just difficult to use. They're not really using the full capabilities of the digital devices they're deployed on. Let's take an example with the image on the left. Here you have a user 
um, type in yogurt on a dietary tracking application, one of the most popular dietary tracking applications. As you can see, you have more than six different results for yogurt. Each of these is for a different brand and the calorie range is more than 40, plus or minus 40 kilocalories in terms of the range of calories in each of these products. Now, if you are in a country where these brands are available, this is great because you are very sure that by selecting the right yogurt brand, you would have the right calories tracked. And therefore, you could be sure that the feedback you're getting from the app is very correct. Unfortunately, if you live in countries where these brands aren't available, like me here in Rwanda, then it's confusing because if I choose the wrong ones, I could be 40 kilocalories off the real calorie intake for today. And so I'm losing confidence in the ability of this app to really help me change my dietary behavior, potentially to change my weight. But then there's an additional complication. Here's an image of one of the staple foods in East Africa. I've circled it in red and it looks like mashed potatoes, but this is actually a cornmeal mush called ugali. It's popular across East Africa. It's typically eaten by hand. And in some communities, like in my native country of Tanzania, it's actually served on a shared dish. So you can never really estimate how much of it you're eating very easily. Not only is ugali not present in many dietary tracking applications, which means if you eat this, you cannot really accurately track your calories, but even the serving quantities do not reflect the fact that it's commonly shared in one bowl and it's eaten by hand. So I can't even estimate how many grams I've eaten based by how many handfuls I've taken. All this to say, we're not really using behavior change intervention theories very effectively. We're not even using the digital platforms themselves very effectively. And so that's the other part of my research is to look at how do we better leverage all these onboard sensors that we have um, to better help people track their behaviors for more improved feedback, but also how do we then offer them the interventions they need so that they're able to change their behaviors. And today I'll be talking about two studies, one for rural populations in sub-Saharan Africa, which is on livestock biometrics. This is the first study we'll talk about. And the second is for urban populations, and this is about predicting pregnancy complications. I will mention that even though the key goal is behavior change, uh, we've learned the hard way, unfortunately, that in order to offer behavior change interventions, you first need to identify the right type of application to offer people. So I might be interested in weight loss behavior change, for example, but I don't really want to do calorie tracking. And so if I downloaded that app, I would never open it, never use it. But I might be interested in another type of application. And if you put these um, behavior change interventions into that type of application, I'm more likely to be engaged with it and use it over the long term. And so part of my study looks at co-creation, really trying to identify what are the applications people want to see for finance, for health? What features do they want? How do they want the interfaces designed to be easy for them to navigate? and then looking at opportunities to offer digital behavior interventions there. So as mentioned, let's start with livestock biometrics. This is a study that we initially started here in Rwanda in collaboration with um, a lot of people down at Silab Africa. And the key question we wanted to look at is this issue of lack of uptake of formal credit. And by formal credit, I mean taking loans from financial institutions and lack of uptake of um, insurance among smallholder rural farmers. Um, and this is important because if you have any loss or theft, then your goods are gone. You have to pay for them out of pocket. You're not financially resilient. So we really wanted to address this and ask, how can we improve uptake of formal credit and agriculture insurance products from the current levels of 25% use of formal credit and 1.5% of insurance uptake? After several rounds of literature review and speaking to some of the key stakeholders, so some smallholder farmers themselves, we realized that the, the thing that kept popping up is there's a lack of opportunity, that currently financial institutions will only secure loans with titled land or with cars, but that's not the key asset that people in rural areas own. So, in rural areas, 
only 10% of people in sub-Saharan Africa own a titled land. And there's a bunch of reasons why this is the case. They range all the way from gender issues to lack of um, available systems to, to prove and apply for a title deed. But what we do see is that 60% to 80% of smallholder farmers have livestock. And that's because it's a considered a great asset to invest in, much like people would invest in stocks and bonds. The reason for this is that livestock tends to keep its value over time. Even as they get old, they would still have a good resale value. But while you also own livestock, you're able to use them for farming, for carrying heavy loads, for milk. And so this is a almost widely owned, ubiquitously owned asset, but it's not very acceptable for financial institutions. One, because you can't uniquely identify the different livestock. So how do I know? This livestock is the same one you showed me yesterday. But then you also can't prove ownership. How do I know that this livestock really belongs to the farmer? And you can't trace it over time, unlike cars. So we thought, would having a system for uniquely identifying and tracking these individual livestock improve the opportunity to access credit and insurance services? And would improved opportunity to access these services in turn lead to improved uptake of credit and insurance services? So currently, when it comes to identifying livestock, people usually just brand them, and the more upscale farmers would use tagging, ear tags. But both of these can be easily changed, so they're not the most reliable forms of identification. But humans are identified by their voice, by their irises, fingerprints, even the way we walk. Can't we do the same for livestock? There's been a bunch of studies that have popped up in the field that show that, yes, you can actually do this for livestock. And when it comes to cattle, which is the predominant type of livestock owned that has great value, um, muzzle prints, so the nose prints are unique and could be used for unique identification and tracking. But the first question we had is, is it feasible to use animal biometrics, muzzle print images for the African context? Because the studies we were coming across we're using really high quality images. Um, this is an example of a data set here that has high quality images. You can see all the lines and grooves on the muzzle print from over 268 cows. This data set was collected in the US, but in rural Africa, smartphones are still of a lower quality. So you're likely to get less uh, resolution in your images. But also if we wanted to use machine learning methods, which is the predominant technique, we would have to send this possibly to the cloud, the images to the cloud for processing and then identifying which cattle this is. So the classification problem would be um, each class would be a different cattle. And so we would have to really compress the data to be able to do this in the very, very slow Internet connections in the rural areas. So to test if this would be feasible for the African context. We actually compressed the images in the data set and changed the color quality, applied some blur to show that this cattle might be moving and try to simulate just basically low quality images as much as we possibly could. And then we ran it through deep learning architectures to try and see how accurately we could predict the individual cattle, the 258 cattle from these low quality images versus how well we could predict them from the high quality images. So I haven't included the mathematical tables and calculations we made. Suffice it to say, at the end of it, we thought this would be a very feasible result because we were approximately approximating 99.4% accuracy for the compressed images, which is pretty much the same as the 99.5% accuracy we had with the original data set. But we were taking an hour to train the data anytime we tried to add new images. And so what this essentially meant was, if we were to register a new cattle today, we would potentially have to wait an hour before we're able to identify it. And so we weren't sure if this was a reasonable wait. So one of our second questions was, well, what stake, uh, use cases would stakeholders want to see? And because I like to use human-centered design, we went out and spoke to a couple of farmers as well as veterinary agents just to see what they were proposing. And the first big revelation for us is while we had started this project around financial inclusion, they had a whole ecosystem of applications they wanted to see. So the use case that we coupled up from the interviews was a, a farmer would use their smartphone to capture muzzle prints and use those muzzle prints to register individual livestock. Each of them would have a cattle ID. 
uh, to protect themselves from theft, their cattle IDs would be linked to his national ID to prove his ownership. But then also because sometimes it's difficult to, under to remember which cattle was vaccinated when, and the paper records fade with time, they also wanted to have electronic debt records that could be accessed by unique cattle IDs. And all this data, plus their financial data from mobile money, could potentially then be used by financial institutions um, to offer them a credit score. So all this to say, we started out with financial inclusion and realized the scope of this has to widen quite a bit. The requirements are changing. So we want to run further co-creation sessions to understand what are the requirements for the other stakeholders? What would financial institutions want? What would regulatory authorities want? We then need to create a local data set with local cattle breeds using local cameras just to no longer have to use simulated data, but rather real life data and rerun uh, the models that we've been having to see whether how feasible it is to meet the use cases that we'll identify. And so the very last step after all this is we will be where we are able to actually implement the behavior change techniques and evaluate the impact of having such a system on borrowing and insurance purchase behaviors. So that's the first project that I've been working on. The second project is around pregnancy complications prediction. And this was started when I was faculty in Tanzania. It was really motivated by the fact that across East Africa, the, the major causes of death are in pregnancy are all preventable. If you could diagnose them earlier, you could treat them. But as I mentioned in the very first slide, women are arriving to the care centers late and doctors are slow to diagnose. So we really asked ourselves, how could we change this current behavior of delayed care seeking and treatment when dangerous signs emerge? And we really wanted to look at capability. So how do we improve knowledge and skills to detect and address pregnancy complications? So we started with a, a survey study with over 127 women in urban Arusha, which is in Tanzania. But we also did a series of observations and just tried to understand what are the technologies they're currently using around pregnancy and what are the barriers. Here are the top three things they were saying. Nutrition information was emphasized in clinical sessions with doctors, so that's what they wanted the most, but they weren't able to get this online. What they got instead was pregnancy week by week information, which was engaging, but not actionable. And sometimes what they used, apps like Baby, Baby Center, contradicted what their doctors told them. So who do you trust? But we also noticed that they Googled their symptoms quite a bit. We did the study in a maternity clinic, and we found that even when they were in the queues, they were constantly Googling, but they struggled to find the right English words to type, and they couldn't use the native Kiswahili because there's not really much available online. But once they did find the right words, they also just used the links at the top. They didn't check for the credibility of the website. So we wanted to see if we implemented an application. So this is just the early prototype. If we implemented an application that didn't require you to think of the English terms, but rather have a list and select them much like you can on um, the WebMD app, and these are then used to predict what complication you have and you're linked to credible resources. What would be the acceptance of this? And we also combine some nutrition information in a week by week format with actions that women can take each week to see again how they would respond to this. We found when we tested with pregnant women and health workers that there was very good acceptance overall. And so this for us revealed that there's need for further research in this area. And so some of the current work we're doing, we are developing a high fidelity prototype. So a pregnancy, full scale pregnancy app that we can evaluate in the wild without predictions, just to see if we're getting the features that women want correct. But then we're also trying to implement some local languages. We don't have a lot of training data for local languages um, for the machine learning module, but could we have enough to have a Q and A module to at least explain some of the concepts? We're also trying to use some of the data from the US to improve the predictions that we were able to achieve. And we want to look at how you support voice input for low literacy populations, and then combine all of this, the pregnancy app and the machine learning modules to come up with another app that we can test in the wild to see its impact on care seeking behavior and addressing of pregnancy complications. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Edith, 
Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Such important research and so fascinating. Uh, really appreciate you presenting this to us today. Um, thank you to everyone who just joined us. My name is Gina Henry, and I'm the Associate Dean for Advancement um, for the College of Engineering, and I'll be moderating the Q&A uh, today. So if you have questions for Edith that you would like to ask her about this presentation, please um, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and um, submit your questions, and we will, uh, we will get some answers from Edith. So Edith, we've already had some good questions coming in. Um, so I want to start with uh, sort of following the, the line of your presentation. Start with livestock biometrics. So what are you planning to investigate next to solve the scalability challenge in this, this livestock biometric system? Yeah, so... The scalability challenge, we've actually started some experiments already where we've been looking at, instead of having to retrain a whole deep learning model, could we just extract features using deep learning? So extract the mathematical patterns that describe the biometrics for the cow and use those in some kind of vector mathematics like dot product. So we're not extracting and then trying to match it. We're just applying some mathematics to estimate as best as we possibly can. We've had some promising results. I'll say promising because it seems to work well enough when we do it in the lab. We're not quite sure if it would do well enough if we had less data. So each cow that we currently have in the data set, we have hundreds of images for them. But in the real world, would we have hundreds of images? So that's one of the things we really want to investigate. Get the data set, re-implement the, uh, the approaches that we're looking at and see how well they perform. Very interesting. So one of your other stated goals is to be able to perform real-time tracking of livestock. Uh, what problems would you need to solve to achieve this? So the number one problem would be network connectivity. The majority of livestock in East Africa is not actually kept in barns, despite the fact that there are increasingly policies to try and have zero grazing systems just for environmental degradation reasons. Um, so out in the wild where there might be poor network, low connectivity, what can we actually do to keep um, the connectivity going? So let's, let's say you were using some kind of drone that is retransmitting these images. How do you keep that connection? So the, the network challenge would be the biggest one. But thankfully, at CMU Africa, we do have colleagues who are working on rural connectivity, looking at ad hoc networks. So that's a great area for collaboration for us. And hopefully they would have some great insights for us and solutions. That uh, leads us directly into another question that came up, which is, um, what do you think the impact of Starlink might be? So I think you just sort of addressed that. But do you have any other, other comments? Um, I think it's a useful rural connectivity solution if it can be affordable. Um, I think currently it costs around a hundred and something dollars to install. I, but majority of the people in the rural areas would not really have that at the start. So if we could have better credit financing, maybe that could be a feasible solution. But I don't also know if we've had a lot of research around just satellite connectivity in general and the, the delays that we can expect, but that would be an interesting um, question to explore. And I think the, the researchers that you mentioned earlier at CMU are yes. looking at how to reduce costs around this, this sort of... Yes, but we are actually, they are actually looking at using local buses that move from one town to another uh, because they are just, they're already running anyway. There's no additional cost to onboarding equipment to them except for the cost of the equipment itself. Uh, they're fairly frequent, so they could potentially be a cheap way to get connectivity happening if you could have an ad hoc network with buses. Very good. So we had another question come in that asked, um, would this livestock biometric approach um, that you discussed, particularly uh, using with cattle, work with other types of livestock, so goats or chickens? Yeah, so that's actually a question we ourselves are asking. Uh, frankly, I do not really know. We know for cattle that definitely muzzle prints are unique. 
We're not really sure about the other animals, but we do have another colleague at CMU Africa who would be interested in trying the same techniques out on pigs. So over the summer, that's what we plan to do. We plan to test it on pigs and see how accurate it is for other types of animals. But that being said, I think iris recognition and um, definitely gait recognition, which we hadn't started with just because we wanted to test the feasibility of this overall, those would be potentially biometrics that could be useful for pretty much all animals. And that's definitely some of the future, future, future work. Once we get this working right for cattle, would be to explore other types of biometrics for other animals. Very fun. That's good. Um, so we had a question come in around uh, data, particularly. Uh, are there other mm -hmm. useful, helpful databases from major um, health organizations uh, that could that are well documented and that could provide uh, useful retrospective learnings, such as WHO and some of the other organizations that collect date, large data sets. So would this be, be for the livestock biometrics or for the maternal? I think that's what this person is referring to. Yes. Okay. For the livestock biometrics. No, we have not. Maybe. Sorry. I mean, I guess it applies Maybe. to either. <laughs> yeah. No, we have not come across any large data sets across around livestock in general. More, it tends to be more around livestock numbers, livestock costs, but not really around livestock's unique biometric features that could be used for such use cases. So we we haven't come across those yet. But if you do come across them, please do share. Thank you. Um, we had a, a question staying with the livestock theme here. Who would own and operate the livestock ownership registry, which you had on the, the chart? Would it be veterinarians or government or another entity? And that's a great question that we weren't really able to answer. So when we first started the interviews and we were thinking about this just being for collateral, we were thinking financial institutions would be the owners. But then coming and seeing all these use cases that vets and livestock farmers are coming up with, we realized we need to engage other stakeholders. So governments need to be involved, other regulatory authorities need to be involved. And this really needs to be a discussion as to if this was to be made a real system, who would own it and what constraints would they want that system to have? And then for us to try and figure out then how do we technically make this work without compromising too much on what users want to see. And so that's another, when it came to the next steps, the number one next step for the Livestock Biometric Project was, let's not even talk about feasibility so much anymore. Let's try and get the use cases defined in co-creation sessions, because the requirements that come up from that are what will really drive any future feasibility studies we do around user requirements and around technical requirements. Very good. Um, so let's see, I uh, had a couple of questions on financing. I'm looking to see if I can sort of combine these two into one. Um, there was a question on the financing side of things and the development of microfinancing capabilities for potential users. So has this come up in your research at all? I'm sorry, could you rephrase that? Yeah, so um, people are curious about is it where... Um, is it mostly private financing for um, the, the livestock biometric collection and tracking? And then wondering about microfinancing, if that has come into play at all. Uh, okay, so if I understand it correctly, people are asking where would the financing come from? I think so. If yeah. this, okay, ideally this would be formal lines of credit. So anything from a banking institution, a microfinance institution, anybody who offers large amounts of credit but they tend to want secured loans, uh, to give up secured loans, rather than asking for title plans, they could potentially use livestock. So the current situation is that if you don't have access to that type of security, you cannot access these loans. So you're limited to either borrowing from uh, mobile money providers who are telecom operators who will give micro loans, something that's like two days worth of expenses, not really enough credit for you to upscale your farm, or to insure your products, to buy, to pay the premium for your livestock products or for your farm. Um, and the other way people borrow now is informal lending groups. So we have 
um, groups called things like sacos where people will pull money every month and then they will lend each other the money. But it's minuscule amounts of money, obviously, compared to what you could access from a formal financial institution. So our goal is really that formal line of credit and then looking at how that impacts on borrowing behavior and insurance uptake behaviors. Very good. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, I want to switch gears a minute away from livestock and addressing some of the maternal um, research that you're doing. You mentioned in passing Scilab Africa. Uh, are there concerns um, that uh, that that people have in terms of sharing information or people adopting the technology because of privacy issues or concern around privacy issues? It did not come up initially in the data, and that's partly because from what we observed, most people were just using um, Google or just the, let's say, a baby center app and not really inputting their private data. And part of it came down to, I wanted in nutrition information. I'm not really getting it. So you're not really as invested in the app to put in your private data. Now, one of the things we do want to test now that we are building the full scale app with the features is to really see how does having the features people want influence the sort of data they want to share. But even more of interest to me, um, smartphones are becoming ubiquitous in Sub-Saharan Africa. About 46% of the population has access to a smartphone, but that's not 100%. So that potentially means you could have users who have somebody in the household or in the community with the smartphone, but it's not their personal device. So in the situation where they wanted to access these apps, how should we design to preserve their privacy? Because it would be a shared device, essentially. It would not be a personal device. That's really one of the key research questions I want to address when we get to starting to test this app. Very good. That's something that I think um, is, a, is another complete uh, element to consider. So it's very good. Um, were there any suggestions that you came across during this research on how to design mobile health apps to prevent tensions between doctors and patients and yes oh plenty plenty the doctors <laughs> want the whole app to have their pictures their videos they should be talking to the patients so it should be sort of like um, an online course sort of app but the patients want more than that they're okay with having the information um linked to specific doctors but they want more than that they also want to understand why is my doctor saying i should not care about this so i can give an example um one of the tensions that comes up if you've ever used the baby center apps and uh, what to expect apps for example is that it pops up with toxoplasmosis uh, and this is something it's a bacteria that would usually be found if you keep cats who use a litter box and you clear out the litter box but in Tanzania, most cats are outdoor cats, so they wouldn't necessarily have a litter box, so it wouldn't necessarily be a test that's given. Doctors are much more likely to emphasize testing for malaria and um, providing malaria prophylaxis. Now, when it comes to the pregnant woman, I'm not seeing malaria on baby center. I'm seeing toxoplasmosis. I'm telling you to care about the fact that I want a toxoplasmosis test, and you're telling me let's care more about malaria. But because of the limited amount of time that doctors and patients have to interact, it's not a conversation that can be done to its entirety. And that's where I think having modules that could answer questions, ideally in local languages, just because we saw how much people struggled with coming up with the right English words um, would be a great thing. Now, the problem we're facing there is we don't really know the amount of information available online in our local languages to train any question answering modules. And so that's one of the research work that we have just started. Um, and that's why I just briefly mentioned that we're looking into the feasibility of this. If we could find enough local language information to be able to answer some of these frequently asked questions, that would be an, a very good way to address some of the tensions that doctors and patients have. Thank you. Um, that leads directly into another question that, that came up, which is um, uh, that you mentioned uh, that patients often have the uh, challenges finding the right English word to you know to translate into yeah. into the app. Did you look into any sort of translation software that could be included mm -hmm. you know, using AI perhaps in the app? Uh, I'll start by mentioning that this was done when we first did this um, survey and the first prototype. This was just as COVID 
was kind of easing up and then came back again. So this was around uh, 2021. So the status of AI translation tools then and now has changed significantly. So that's something we want to reevaluate actually. But back then, yes, we did look into the translations. They weren't very accurate. And even more concerning is um, even the local resources, the medical reports that we could access from Tanzania well, were all written in English, and there wasn't an easy way to translate them into Swahili so that we could um, offer the predictions in Swahili. Uh, that being said, what we did realize was a useful compromise was for a lot of the women in Tanzania, you typically study in English, but the challenge comes um, when you look at where English is used. You are used to using English in school and at work. You would never really have to describe what a pounding headache is in Kiswahili, in I mean in English, to your doctor. And so it was the medical terms specifically and coming up with the right ones, that was the challenge, as opposed to if it was given to them, they would recognize it. But if it wasn't given to them, it's a, it's a challenge to figure it out in terms of translating it. And Google Translate, unfortunately, would not be very helpful then. We'll try it again now and see, um, and hopefully we'll have more updated results. And in, in that same line of thinking, you're going to encounter some potential users who maybe have lower literacy than others. So have you yes. considered using any sort of graphics or visual elements or anything like that in the interface in order to make it more accessible for, uh, mm -hmm. for lower literacy people? Yes, so we hadn't considered graphics yet. It's a suggestion that's been popping up recently in the talks I've had this year. So that's definitely something to add. What we had considered was voice, um, just because some of the more ubiquitous technologies, things like mobile money that were traditionally offered via SMS are now available via voice interfaces as well. So we were thinking maybe voice interfaces might be an easy option. Um, so we were, we, one of the, uh, studies that I mentioned we are currently trying to do is to look at voice analytic speech processing in local languages like Swahili to see how accurate it would be, but also to look at how useful the inputs we get would be in terms of understanding what the woman actually means so that we can give them the right predictions. Thank you. I'm getting a lot of, we're getting a lot of comments in the Q&A about what a super interesting talk this is and a lot of thank yous from our audience. Oh, thank, so, you. Uh, thank you to everyone who's been, um, who has been uh, commenting on that and we're glad that you're enjoying it. Um, just a couple more questions uh, here and if, just a reminder to the audience, if you do have any uh, last minute questions, we've just got a few minutes left, please submit those via the Q&A button down at the bottom. Um, you talked about the challenge of uh, adopting these technologies, uh, yeah. of people adopting these technologies. Can you talk about some of the best ways that you found to to achieve adoption in rural areas of this, particularly the the maternal app that you spoke about? So we haven't really tested any of the theories, but my biggest theory it comes from the inspiration of mobile money. Like I mentioned. Mobile money is just when a telecom provider, so your cell phone provider, offers you a virtual account. So you can put money under your phone number and then you can transfer money to other people's phone numbers, that kind of service. It was launched, I think, around 2007, but it was actually a workaround that people were already using in Kenya. And the reason for the very, very fast adoption is that it was necessary. So in some of my previous talks, I used to show people a pipeline of what it was like back in 2007, when my mother used to send money to her mother in the village, it would take about two to three days because she would have to give it to someone, usually a bus driver, an intercity bus driver. You'd pay him something to act as the mailman. He'd get to that other city, which is about 600 miles away, give the money to somebody who has been sent from another 150 miles away to pick up the envelope and take it to my grandmother. And now with mobile money, I'm in Rwanda, she's in Tanzania. In literally 30 seconds, I can send money to her. Mobile phones were not ubiquitous in rural areas when mobile money was launched, but it really created the demand because this was a service people needed. So my whole theory is, before you even start thinking about behavior change, start by asking people, what are the gaps in the apps that they're facing? And this is why a lot of my work is human-centered and it starts with, well, you're having um, trouble accessing finance. What sort of apps would you want to help you with finance? And really trying to understand 
and designing those apps and then leveraging behavior change technologies on those apps rather than creating brand new apps just for the behavior change. But we'll Fair. test it after deployment. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a hypothesis. There's so many interesting questions to dive into. I, I, uh, I love hearing about your research and all the, the questions that you're you're struggling with and and looking to answer. So, um, okay. So we had a question about uh, connections back to the CMU campus in Pittsburgh. Um, you yes. talked a little bit about um, Scylla, but can you talk about mm -hmm. which is also a, 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 in Pittsburgh, of course? Um, can you talk about uh, how, what you see in terms of connections back to the home campus? that are relevant, sorry, to the, this was the, the to the Pittsburgh campus, um, that are relevant to the research that you're doing, uh, and uh, how that might be helpful. Okay, so actually, a lot of these studies, I haven't mentioned the names, just because there are a lot of names to mention. But let's take the livestock biometrics. We are collaborating with professors in Pittsburgh who are in image process, who do a lot of the image processing um, advising for us. We're also with the maternal health project. I'm not um, collaborating with somebody from CMU, uh, CMU Pittsburgh yet, um, but we have been in discussions with people. I had some discussions with people from CMU Qatar but also because they, she was working on low resource languages and the speech processing around that. Um, but we're also looking to leverage some connections with um, Pitt University's medical department to see what sort of data we can access from the US to really improve the predictions that we're wanting. So one of the challenges with human-centered design and AI is that the stakeholders you're talking to aren't always aware of exactly what AI can and can't do. They have a broad understanding of it because they've seen applications, but they don't understand where it might fail and therefore how they should react when it might fail. And so part of the part of the approach we're having to use is to build some kind of models that we can then take and show people that this is how much you could get reasonably in terms of accuracy, in terms of time performance, and then trying to get their assessments of that. So the better the prediction accuracy, the better the feedback we would get rather than using just limited data. So really just using those connections in Pittsburgh to access some of the US data so we can apply transfer learning and improve the model. So we're telling people what they can reasonably expect and what they can't expect and finding ways to design interfaces so that they're able to navigate any failures in AI. Very good. And I think that's one of the strengths of the CMU network around the world is that um, you're now yes. plugged into a lot of, uh, you mentioned CMU Qatar and, you know, it's a lot of different um, connections around the world. Well, Edith, this has been fascinating. Um, we are closing in on uh, running out of time. So I just want to take, uh, take a, a last minute to say thank you again so much um, for this great presentation. We, um, we will uh, be sending out an email, um, and I want to thank everybody who's participating today. We will be sending out an email soon, um, which will include the, the link to recording. So if you want to watch this great session again, um, you'll be able to do that. And we really appreciate uh, the great audience that we've had here today, the great interactive audience, throwing lots of good questions at us. Um, Edith, we wish you the best and, and look forward to thank hearing you. an update soon on uh, on the research. Um, and for everybody online, please keep an eye out for additional emails coming out from our office soon to talk about other faculty researchers and highlights and, and faculty insights programming. So thank you, everyone. Have a lovely day wherever you are in the world.